So now I have a bunch of questions. Uh, before we get into Pacific Rim, I have what we call some curveballs. Oh. Probably the most important question is right up front. All right. If, uh, has so- if someone has never seen a Studio Ghibli movie, what is the one they should start with? Wow. I don't know. We uh, The first one, I mean, I saw the work him and Takahata uh, were doing in Toei when I was a kid. And then many years later, when I saw the first Ghibli movies, I said, that that's like the movies I saw as a kid. So they have such a recognizable seal. Uh, but I think it's always good to start start with Totoro, you know, because it's uh, the power of Miyazaki is that he shows you something that is impossibly beautiful and painfully beautiful. This is something that very few filmmakers do. When something is so absolutely staggeringly beautiful as a piece of art, that you understand that you will never experience it in real life, you at the same time gain it and lose it. Meaning you you get a sense of almost melancholy and you're moved to tears. Because uh, when Totoro started, I started weeping. And I never stopped during the film because it was at the same time uh, a childhood that I was gaining and a childhood that I had never been. So I think that's a great one to start with. You have an amazing resume, but there's going to be people out there who have I'm, never... I, I can type. <laughs> I'm <laughs> venting. People have never seen... There's going to be people out there that have never seen anything you've done before. Yeah. So if someone is never... My seen, mother. <laughs> if someone has never seen a Guillermo del Toro film, yeah. uh, what is the one you'd like them starting with and why? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, for example, the movie we saw today, I absolutely fucking lovely adore. You know, Pacific, I, I adore. Depends. Like, to me, the thing is my preoccupations and my images go from one genre that is gigantic to something that is very intimate. So it's like when, when, when you study filmmakers you admire, like Hitchcock. Hitchcock has a, a side of him that is pure melodrama. The best one of those is Notorious, in my opinion. Then he has intimate, really psychological and dark movies, the best one of which is Shadow of a Doubt. Then he has spectacle movies, and the best one of which are arguably either North by Northwest or The Birds, So and, and so on and so forth. So depends on what you want to do. If you're going for kick-ass, I would go Pacific Rim. <laughs> if you're going for beauty and... Weirdness, I would go to Crimson Peak. <laughs> if you're going for, I mean, uh, the, the more intimate movies, I would go Pan's Labyrinth, Devil's Backbone, or uh, uh, Shape of Water. But so, you know, whatever. I mean, if you don't like it, don't watch another. If you like it, watch another. Uh, which of your, which film in your resume changed the most in the editing room in ways you didn't expect. And I guess I should caveat without Mimic. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, Mimic in the editing room was pretty steady. That's what is weird. All the crap came during the shoot. The editing was actually you know, pretty steady because once they saw that it worked, that it did what it me- was meant to do, they, they increasingly left me alone. So, no, I think I think that uh, what you what happens is you discover this movie. For example, we had two editors, and I needed a change of editor because uh, you know we when you go through a movie that is takes this long or is this complex, you know you want to shake it, and 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 once you went through four or five months of post, the editor and you have the same point of view. You know, so you you need to bring somebody else, and and this movie uh, was really it benefited from that. We split the attack, the Hong Kong battle in two. We were able to split the flashback uh, to Michael's childhood. We did a, a lot of stuff that was very adventurous in this film. I could be wrong, but I read that there was like an hour of footage that you took out. Is that true or not? That's no, always the case. <laughs> Sure, but but yeah. I, read, I read every movie I've ever done is three hours in the first cut. I, I read that there was a lot more stuff in the first act of the film that yeah. you ended up removing. Yeah, because um, it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So was the, no, you're not missing anything. Right. So for fans, they're not missing. There's no scenes that you. No, are like, like like for example, Nightmare Alley has another hour that is fantastic. That I I would love to do like a three-part miniseries with Nightmare Alley 
because a lot of those uh, st stories that Kim and Morgan and I wrote were uh, sort of intertwined in a beautiful way, and, uh, and that I would love to put back. So, I, I, specific question about that. I know that Hulu is doing like this six part, and I could be wrong about six part. A version of Australia, you know, the Hugh Jackman movie. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and is there any chance with Hulu or, you know, Disney Plus or one of these kinds of things? Um, I feel like the audio went out. Oh, no, there it is. Uh, that is there any possibility of, of doing that with Nightmare Alley? I would like love to. I would love to. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always game for more work. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really am a workaholic, so... You know, I don't know what to do with free time. Well, I hope that happens, actually. Me too. Um, what do you think would surprise people to learn about being a filmmaker in Hollywood on, on your level, which is someone who gets to, you know, make personal films, but big films? Like, I guess I just want to pull the curtain back on what it's like for you in Hollywood. You know, it's horrible. <laughs> I mean, it's horrible always. What I mean is, no, it's not horrible. It's a great profession. And it's great to be in Hollywood or in Spain or in every, everywhere you are. But what is very funny is uh, when you look at a career from the outside, you're looking at a career that seems to have some order or you think it was planned. But it's what happened. I mean, I, I, I always say this statistic, but lately I counted, finally, I counted the screen. I've written more than 40 screenplays. 40. I made 12 movies. So there are more than 30 screenplays that never got made and, and, and that were written or co-written with somebody. And, and uh, that means uh, between one movie and another, like you see them now and you say, oh, and then he did. No, then it's five years where I didn't work. Five years, years where I didn't direct. Kronos uh, to Mimic is five years. Mimic to Devil's Backbone, five years. Five years. So uh, it is every career always you are, every time between movies, they, they think I'm joking when I say I'm unemployed. But you basically are as a director. And every movie you go out with is on, uh, you should always consider because it could be your last movie. And, and people think that there is something that, you know, when people say when you get there, what the fuck do you mean by that? Where is there? I've never been there because you never get there because there is no there. There's there for five filmmakers in the world, if that. And I, one of my best friends in life, more than 30 years of friendship, is Jim Cameron. And I have seen Jim as a, as a friend every time have so much to overcome in making the next movie. Not only technical and all that that everybody knows, but just pushing it through. Pushing it through because he's always trying things that haven't been done. And when you try, if you're going to do, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to say names, but if you want to do something that is super safe, well, I don't know. I've, I've always done the movies that nobody else is doing that sound crazy in paper. And, and you pitch them and people validate your parking ticket and send you on your way. Oh, I'm, I want to do a Civil War fairy tale uh, that where the girl dies at the end. Oh, fantastic. You know, nobody wants to do it. Pinocchio, uh, almost 20 years to get Pinocchio made. Uh, and keep going. I mean, this movie was great because Thomas Toll from, uh, and uh, John Jashin at Legendary wanted it. And they gave me the 10-page treatment that Travis Beecham had written. And I said, oh, hold on a second. Giant Robert Jan was like, hey, <laughs> you're kidding, right? I mean, because I'm going to go. I'm going to go do it. And, and we went really fast. But uh, even then, we had to do it for a, for a number. And we had to put the scale of it with a number that is big. I don't, don't get me wrong. If, if I get that money, I would be very happy. I would move to Brazil and they cannot extradite me. But to make the movie, it was 50, 60 million shorter than another movie of that size that year. It was, it was tight. We did it. So we had to be very smart about the resources. But I always say, and this comes from being Mexican, you know, you, you have to have, you have to define as you direct. I always say, is this meatballs or is it gravy? 
meatballs you put like and you have to do big gestures like uh, for example if you watch shape of water it's a movie that costed 19.3 million dollars but i knew i needed to open with a big gesture so people go oh you know and so i open with the underwater apartment and her floating and then i went to a, a bus and i went to a big big government facility And then I went into a long corridor and a big lab, and you went, oh, it's a big movie. No, it isn't. If you stay for the rest of the movie, we're on the same three fucking sets the rest of the time. <laughs> But you do that gesture. And then there's always a sequence in the middle that you say, okay, I'm shooting four pages a day, but for this sequence, I want seven days. And you take that sequence and you make it count. And, and then you do another gesture a little later, and those are meatballs. The rest, you, the gravy, you got to do quick. Or, you know something? I like the way you just flowed with your answer. Yeah. Let's move on to something else. I like it, but what was it? Uh, I think I asked about making movies in Hollywood and oh, what would surprise there you people. Oh, it was a good answer. <laughs> uh, go figure. When you look back on your old, like on Pacific Rim, it's mm. been 10 years. Yeah. When you look at it again, do you see shots that you wish you could go in and tweak? Or do you accept that once the movie is done and you've let it go and it's been released, that that's the way it's going to be and it's not really something to touch again? Do you know what I mean? Like, can you yeah. let it go? Oh, fuck yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, because a, a movie is a capsule of where you are. Like I was saying, for you guys, it's filmography. For me, it's biography. Like I was, I was a mediocre brother, a half-wit uncle, not a great, uh, tremendous weekend father. And like I failed in my personal life to make movies. You know, you cannot do both. You cannot be really great at what you do and really great at everything else. You got to decide, look, this is what I'm going to do. And, and uh, so it's a biography. This is when I missed the birthday. This is when I wasn't, uh, you are absent of a lot of your personal life. So to then say, I'm going to go back and change what, what came out of it. No, no, you don't. You don't do that. I, I don't do it. I mean, I tried with one, two goddamn shots on Blade Two that I hate, uh, which is the fight in front of the lights, uh, and, and it didn't work. So God was saying, "Yeah, oh, sit, sit down, man." Christopher Nolan recently had a tremendous success uh, releasing Oppenheimer in IMAX, IMAX 70. It was an amazing experience uh, when I witnessed it in that format. I'm just curious if. Because uh, we're in IMAX right now, mm -hmm. and I love IMAX. It's my favorite format. I love the the everything about this. So my question is: Have you thought about shooting an upcoming project using you know IMAX cameras for the whole thing? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just curious what the success of Oppenheimer. Do you think that's opened the door for more film studios thinking about IMAX as a you know shooting? You get where I'm going with this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't talked to anyone of the studios because we were in a strike. So I'm a hyphenate. I had three reasons not to talk to anyone at the studio. <laughs> so I stayed, uh, you know, I made model kits on Sundays. You know, the, so wh wh why, wh I, what happened? I don't know what happened in the studios. But I can tell you, uh, almost in every big movie, that's the first thing you, you try. And the first thing that in my, when, when I make the movies, I try to make, make them for half the budget to get twice the freedom, right? So that's the first thing. Pacific Rim was going to have a sequence in IMAX. And when they said you have to do it for this number, that's the first thing you have to take out. So I don't have that luxury. I, I am still uh, a guy like, uh, uh, I say this with, I'm, I'm very happy where I am because I'm only doing now what I call bucket list movies. I only, I'm making only movies that I want to do before I croak. And like, I really, really want, if you see what I'm doing, it means it really matters to me. It really is more vital than ever. And, and, uh, but, but it's the first thing they take out of the budget. When they say you have to do it and you go, well, that's a, that's a lot of money I have to take out. That's the first luxury you have to sacrifice, unfortunately. But hopefully that, if that changes, I'll be delighted, man. 
IMAX is an amazing format. Recently, uh, you acknowledged that you were working on a Star Wars film a number of years ago. Yeah. And I'm just curious, how close did you actually come to being in the director's chair helming a Star Wars film? Well, I believe a movie is going to happen when the Blu-ray comes out. <laughs> that's, when, that's when I know it's going to happen. You know, so it, it always, in the last moment, things go away. I've had it happen many, many, many times. Uh, we had uh, uh, the rise and fall of Jabba the Hutt, so, uh, so I, I was super happy. We were doing a lot of stuff. We were, and then, uh, you know, it's not my property, it's not my money. It's one of those 30 screenplays that goes away, you know? And I, sometimes I'm bitter. Sometimes I'm not. I always turn to my team and say, good practice, guys. Good practice. We designed a great world. We designed great stuff. We learned. So you, you can never be ungrateful with life. You can, you know, whatever life sends you, there's something to be learned from it. So, you know, I trust the universe. I do. When something doesn't happen, I go, why? I try to have a dialogue with myself. Why didn't it happen? And And... And the more you swim upstream with the universe, the less you're gonna realize where you're going. So you know, I don't, I don't, I don't take it. The uh, mountains of madness, though, that was really hard, because uh, and, and and it was tough. There are certain things, there are moments that I remember in in the career where it's, you feel the oxygen is leaving the room, and you you wanna. And, and most of them are kept secret, you know, and people don't know what that means or they never learned about it. Mountains of Madness was very tough. The release of this movie was very, very tough. Uh, the release of Crimson Peak, which was released as a horror movie and it wasn't. And I kept saying it's a gothic romance, release it as such. Uh, but the, the crux of the thing is her passage through this mystery is not a, is, and it was released s straight out as our movie. So those are things where you feel the, the bumps. But, um, but you know, the, the, when something doesn't happen, you, you, you came up with a couple of good ideas and you may use them later. Jumping into Pacific Rim mm -hmm. and I have an awful lot of questions. Yeah. When I got, I asked people to uh, submit, uh, if they wanted tickets to this, uh, one way was to write me something. And I said this earlier when we were, um, uh, when I was introducing the film, uh, I had a lot of people that were like, said that they were 11 or 12 or 13 years old when um, Pacific Rim uh, was released and Amazing. how much and how much it meant to them. I and think I was twelve. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's people in here like uh, yeah. that person right there. Great, who, right? Oh um, man, I like this. <laughs> right. So, but like people that it really meant a lot to them, and I didn't yeah. realize because I'm older how much it meant to that generation. Yeah. Uh, how much were you aware of this? Yeah. Well, not not aware. Like what I make movies that. Like I will, I, I now know I'm 58. I know that I will never be able to show everybody every facet of what I am creatively because there is no, not enough time. And those 30 movies that didn't get made, I'm not going to make them at 80, you know? So, but you try to th send into the world movies for you as an audience when you're 11. Pacific Rim is one of those. It's a movie that has the heart the craftsmanship of somebody in his 40s, but the passion of somebody in his uh, early teens, somebody that really gets high on his own supply, you know? Uh, and, and, and when I do that, I always say, whoever watches this movie at 9 or 10 or 11, I envy that person. And I love, it's a love letter from me to that person. Every movie I do, every movie I do is that. Is you, you'll get to know me more seeing the movies than taking a road trip with me. You know, it's, it really is that. So I always say, whoever liked Hellboy will one day discover Pan's Labyrinth or Shape of Water or this or that. And, and that's my relationship with the audience that I cherish. Because it's not about an audience being large, it's an audience being deep. I read, again, this could be wrong, that at one point Tom Cruise might have been in Pacific Rim. Oh, yeah. No, the, the, two, the two models for Pacific Rim, 
And the two models for the screenplay were Hoosiers with Gene Hackman and Top Gun. You know, so uh, the part that Idris Elba plays, Tom Cruise was going to do it. And, and I even had uh, a karaoke scene. <laughs> and and uh, the deal couldn't be made. He wanted to do it. We, you know, we were developing stuff, and uh, he couldn't do it. And I thought, you know what? Let's go for Idris Elba, man. He's a god, you know? And it, obviously, I had to rewrite it for that. But I thought it was going to be a, an interesting analog to, to, do, to do that. And uh, it would have been a lot of fun. I have developed three movies with Tom Cruise, and, and none of the three times we have worked. But uh, we have had quite a laugh, you know. I like it. I like. I like. It. Look, it's my life is so weird. I, I really. I'm like Forrest fucking Gump. I all of a sudden I'm 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 in places that I don't know how it happened, but I go. Hey, I like it. <laughs> and, and 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 honestly, is I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. And because there's a saying in, in movies, and it's a really great saying, they say, take the scout, don't make the movie. Because when you're scouting, you are in a, in a basically a, a van trip, a bus trip, with a bunch of people eating in great places and having a great time. It's my favorite part of movies, like when I planned uh, Devil's Backbone, I, I made an itinerant through Spain where they sold the best sausages, the best asparagus, you know, and I, I, we were in, Sco in Scotland scouting for the next movie, and I was mapping where there was a good, a, a good macaroni and cheese pie. And, uh, it's so funny because I've heard from other filmmakers, and they, some of them dread the location scouting. No. And but <laughs> Beth, the, I tell you, the Hobbit. I was there two years, and we and when we were scouting, we were scouting. They gave me a helicopter, <laughs> and I was like, oh. So I would say, let's land on the top of that mountain and have lunch. <laughs> we were we were we were helicoptering by the glaciers. I saw glaciers that were made of fluoride, green, bright green, and I saw glaciers that were blue. I saw Glacier, I mean, it was uh, the whole two years, the scout, uh, and then I got attacked by sand flies, which was a disaster. But other than that, we, we, we would, we, it was amazing. I, I, and some of my, my best memories are prepared a movie, and you still have lunch with remarkable people. I, I just want to be surrounded with great people because it, it's ultimately socially and absolutely useless. I'm inept socially. So the best companionship I have is co-workers, you know, and, and I work with people I admire and people I want to learn from. I want to I wanna discuss one line in a design because whoever says this line and a 10 degree curve is the same thing, they're not designers. Any single change changes the entirety of the design. So when we design a movie, uh, eighty percent of my work is submerged. People just see it, but if you believe it, that means we designed it well. But I, I think a lot of people in here are curious, and I'm not sure how much you've ever said. But how close did you come to actually directing the Pacific Rim sequel? How far along had you developed the script? You know, let's talk a little bit about that. I didn't see the final movie. Because that's like watching uh, uh, home movies from your ex-wife. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's terrible if they're good and worse if they're bad or the opposite. Like you don't want to know. You don't want to know. Uh, so I, I, I didn't, I didn't see it. Uh, but I do. I did read the final script, and it was very different. The some of the elements were the same, but very different. Uh, my, the main character for me in many ways was Mako, Mako Mori. And, and it was, uh, we were getting ready to do it. It was different from the first, but it had a continuation of many of the things I was trying to do. And uh, then what happened is, I mean, this is, this is why it's crazy, right? Uh, they had to give a deposit for the stages at 5 p.m., or we would lose the stages in Toronto for many months. So I, I, I said, don't forget, we're going to lose the stages. And 5 o'clock came and went, 
and we lost the stages. Uh, and they said, well, we, we, we can shoot it in China. And I go, what do you mean we? <laughs> and I'm going to go to the shape of water. Do you think that there was, because the film, this film was so successful in China, mm -hmm. do you think there was an element at the studio, and I'm just, this is hypothetical, I, that they I, wanted it shot in well, China? It, it, it didn't matter to me what it was. What I did is I write a phenomenal part for Donnie Yen. I wanted Donnie Yen. I wanted to, to have Donnie Yen star in a damn movie, a mainstream movie. I was all for it. And we did scout in China again, and we scouted this and that, and I, we were going to do location shooting. But stage, sure. I, I wanted to be in Toronto, you know, for sure. So we had to, you know, there's a thing in stages where you, you're challenged, meaning you have the first hold, and then uh, you get challenged, and if you don't, put the deposit, you lose them. So we had, we lost them. And then I got a couple of the smaller stages for Shape of Water. You love Toronto. What is yeah. it about Toronto that you, because you, you're up there all the time shooting. What, what is it about that city? Well, first of all, the crew is fantastic. The crew is fantastic in Toronto. I know the city really well. Uh, I, I shot the first movie I shot there was in 1996 was Mimic. So I, 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 I know it quite well. It's, it's, there's a cultural life that I like. There's great, two things I need in life. Great bookstores and good restaurants. In that order, I guess. <laughs> and, and, and it has both. So, you know, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. I, I love Toronto. Me too. Love. Uh, and, and, you, and TIFF. Uh, you can go on. I, I do master classes in, in, uh, in, in the Cinematheque. And I, I, I give four or five classes in a row about Alfred Hitchcock or Louis Buñuel or uh, gothic romance. And, and we watch movies and then I discuss them with the audience and we have a, a, a sort of day by day we put together a little bit of a particular part of cinema. And I, I love that. Or I go to, to other people's uh, master classes or I interview people on stage. There's a very active uh, cinema life in Toronto. There's a lot of diehard fans in here. Is there anything, what do you think would surprise hardcore fans about Pacific Rim to learn about the making of Pacific Rim? Oh my God, nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Why would it surprise them? I don't know. Uh, you, you know, uh, the maybe the editing press, I don't know. There's nothing. Uh, there was a lot of work. We created a lot of language that now I see in other movies. And we created a lot of the language of uh, uh, bright colored neon fights in the rain and at night. I was calling the style of it Gothic, which is a mi mixture of Gothic and tech. So I said, let's do a movie that is Gothic, that, that, that has what the Japanese call Wabi Sabi, which is the, the beauty of the imperfect and impermanent. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, George Lucas uses Wabi Sabi on Star Wars, which means everything that you see is not new. It's dented, patched, rusting, corroded. And that adds a beauty and a reality to the layer. If you think science fiction, the biggest leap it took, uh, other than Kubrick, the biggest leap it took was George coming in with Wabi Sabi and making that universe rusty, used, sweat, you know, it has all the reality of a real world, and uh, there's nothing on Pacific. I didn't want a movie that was triumphant. I said, I'm not going to make a movie about one country winning the war. I refuse to do that. I want to make a movie about humanity winning the war and not having the tools. It's not going to be about everything being shiny and cool. It's going to be everything about being rusty and old and cool. Because I think all this cool, and I love, I, 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 I am an animist. I talk to my car. I get in my car every day. It's a car I've had for 13 years. I love my car. I call him El Guapo. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I get into my car, and I, I say, come on, let's go to work. I talk to it. I talk to things in my house. That's how lonely I am. <laughs> no, this is really, I, and I believe that, like the Japanese, that every object has a soul. So I wanted to make the robots soulful and have a personality, not just look cool or shiny. Shiny, to me, is horrible. 
beauty, the beauty is not perfection, it's imperfection. And, and every single thing in Pacific Rim is rusty, dark, f covered with water. And I've, I've seen some of those gestures appear in other films, and, and I like that. I, I think uh, because I watched all the kaiju movies carefully to see what was done that worked and what was never done that I wanted to try. And we went through in, enormous lengths to do the accumulation of rain in the corners. I said, imagine that it's a cathedral fighting. In a cathedral, if you go to the corners, there's an accumulation of water that trickles. And I said, imagine that some um, robot taking the punch has many points of fugue where that water is trickling and we tracked every one of them. I think the only thing that may surprise an audience is that we used actual models. Everybody thinks it's all CG. There's a couple of scenes where we actually did miniatures and destroyed them very, very pointedly. The scene where the fist goes into the office, that's a giant a maxiture of the office. And we had real desks with little papers, little staplers, <laughs> little coffee cups. ILM tweeted some photos. Yeah, yeah. I, I put on Twitter if anyone had any questions, yeah. and they responded with four behind by the scenes. By the way, photos. go to Blue Sky. Right. And God damn it. It's cool. Uh, by the way, yes. I, yeah. Elon can go F himself. Um, that's a whole nother thing. Um, I. I'm curious, because you're making this obviously on a budget, every movie has a budget, and you know that these VFX shots are going to cost a lot of money, in the writing phase, are you thinking about, okay, we're probably going to have the money to do three set pieces or four set pieces, whatever that number is, we need, how are you figuring out where you want to spend the money in a movie like this? And is it in the writing phase? Or do you see what well, I mean? Well, when you're writing, if you're bored writing it, they're going to be bored watching it. It's extremely simple. You're writing and you go, I don't want to be here. Uh, then you shouldn't be there. Why, don't, don't, it's like most of the time when a, when a scene needs a score, you should cut it out. It, it may benefit from score, that's different. But if a scene needs score, it's a bad scene. You should say, I should consider cutting it. And the same is true on the screenplay. You have to pace yourself and stay interested when... when Kim and Morgan, my wife and I, we co-wrote Nightmare Alley. That's how we paced it. If, if she was bored reading what I wrote or I was bored with reading what she wrote, we would say, this is not working. And I think, uh, you know, you, 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 you don't worry about the budget until it's time to do that. I don't think you want to be like that. You, you, I have it in the back of my mind because I was raised in the Mexican cinema industry and you're very, I'm very fiscally responsible. But, but it doesn't, it shouldn't stop you. Like when, when we were doing Hellboy 1, uh, they said you have to cut 10 million. I said then I'll put an extra set piece. <laughs> I will, but, I, but you're not going to make it smaller. And I added the piece with the pendulum where he escapes the pendulum. And, and, and with Pacific Rim, what I did with ILM, uh, I was raised, uh, I had a company that did special effects, we did opticals, we did animation, we did stop motion, we did makeup effects, we did storyboards, we did everything. I'm a, I'm a okay painter, I'm an okay sculptor, and I'm an okay miniature maker. I, I know how to animate. So I have a multidiscipline background. Uh, that allows me to be very, very fluid when I trade what they call horse trading. And, uh, and BFX means uh, I'm going to give you 30 shots of uh, added blinks for the fishman. And in exchange, you're gonna, uh, you don't have to do the fishman swimming underwater. Like you, you trade sure. things. Uh, so with ILM, what we did, which was unprecedented back then, and I don't know if they've done it again, is we came in and said, let's make a sandbox, because this movie is not as big as other movies. We're going to do X number of AAA robot shots. We're going to do X uh, extensions. We're, and we did an inventory, an inventory. And then we traded. And, I, and it, it worked. We finished the movie under. So I, 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 I other than with COVID, or the Weinsteins, I've never gone over. <laughs> and those two were uh, plagues. So, you know, I have an excuse. <laughs> they were pandemics. 
I I read that you filmed the movie in 103 days and yeah. you had a splinter unit that you directed. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically you were working like 17, 18 hour days, seven days a week. Yeah. How do you actually... I, I shoot six days a week and on Sundays I edit. Okay. So, so you actually... So on Sunday it wasn't like a, you on set all day. It was, you no, in an no. editing room. No, yeah. And I edit during lunch. And I, and I give instructions to the editor before. But the result is normally... Normally, 12 weeks after I shoot, I have a cut. Like Devil's Backbone, I completed entirely in 12 weeks after shooting. Completely mixed, color corrected, everything. Uh, Because uh, I needed to go and do Blade 2. I needed to hurry up because uh, when when I made them wait for me. I said, no, I'm going to do the Spanish movie first. I don't care. And they waited. I know... Uh, was the title always going to be Pacific Rim? Did you ever think about changing it to something else? Well, it was in a double program with Jack Reacher, so <laughs> it was not a fortunate program. But uh, I, 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 it was always Pacific Rim from the moment uh, Travis Beecham uh, came up with the 10 pages. And then we wrote, uh, we fleshed out this thing together. And I liked it. I liked, uh, I liked how it sounded, you know? I want to read this question so I get it right. What do you think of drift compatible becoming a common shorthand trope across fandom and for creators in general, since it's still such a unique concept 10 years later? Uh, the, the, that was one of the ideas that I loved in, the, in Travis's thing. And I came up with the, with the term drift compatible. because I, I thought it was uh, like I like slang that sounds casual, like uh, I, you're a jockey. You are Jager, when how long since you jockeyed? Because it's the way you 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 have the patois of the profession, and I I like it. I I think that uh, it is what the movie is about. The movie is about two things for me. It's about leaving fear behind and trusting someone. That's it. It's two people that don't trust anyone, learning to trust each other. That's it, and because. The reason I made the movie was Michael Mori. Uh, the reason, the, because inside that giant robot, there is a, a woman, and inside that woman, there is a little girl. And the fear that that robot is going to enact is linked to that little girl, which is the way we behave every day in our life. We all are jockeyed by a little child that is afraid, that was damaged when we were five or six or seven. That's the way we behave every day in life. When we're hurt uh, in a relationship, when we feel inadequate, that's the six-year-old inside you piloting this considerable body. And that's what the movie's about for me. And it's about uh, a bunch of losers uh, getting together and doing the best they can for each other. You know, So drift compatible is key to that. So you obviously worked with ILM on these visual effects, and I'm curious, what was your reaction in that first meeting when you said, okay, so I want to do this, this, that's already going to be hard, but now we're going to add rain. We're going to have a sequence that's in the water. Oh, wait, actually, let's go underwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, so what's their reaction, and is it any, how much harder is it exponentially when you start introducing those kinds of elements? Well, the hard thing, if you're going to understand this, it, it may sound weird. The one thing is not to betray the mass of the things. So the fights have to be slow. You know, if you don't do that, then they look like guys in suits. So the, uh, when John Knoll, uh, who's a genius uh, at ILM, we, we did, he did charts of displacement of water and air pressure when a Jaeger walks between two buildings. He said the displacement of mass would create this and that. And we said, let's, let's, for example, one thing we did, I said, I don't want any fucking impossible camera moves. I hate cameras that go, woo. And, and, and listen, by, by the way, anytime I'm watching a movie and there's a shot of a fucking drone looking down, I change the channel. <laughs> please, please don't do it. Please don't do it. Except when no one will save you now. That's a great shot because you see the circles of the ships landing. But 
is that is the shot where you go, oh, it's like, a, like a, no, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> uh, anyway, we, I said, I don't want any shot that is shot at out of scale. Tell me if that shot is on a little barge in the water, then the camera needs to be bobbing with it. If it's from a helicopter, I want it moving at that at the speed of a real helicopter. I don't want any whoosh, you know, whooshing shots or impossible shots. So we said, let's grab, let's be fanciful, but rooted in reality. So uh, that is what made it hard. You know, like when we went underwater, John said the first color to disappear, once you get to that deep is this one, this one, this one, and then when you go to the bottom, they, they basically the colors are gone. So we had to look at the reef maps and say this is where the reef would be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We scouted Hong Kong uh, thoroughly. Uh, I ate How was the food? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and, and you know, in, in China, they, 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 when you visit, they try to give you food that is shocking. Like the guest has to eat the eye of the fish, and I'm Mexican. I ate everything. I ate the eye of the fish, the, the, the everything, poor fish. And I, but, but, but we, we scouted. We were, we were in a barge, and uh, a ship went by full of cargo, and I said, what if the Jaeger uses that as a baseball bat? You know, so the, the, when you were scouting, you get all this feedback. So uh, we mapped Hong Kong. And then we got this piece of news. They said in Hong Kong, if you want to destroy a building that is real, you have to get a permit from the designer, the engineer, the owner, and all the tenants. <laughs> and I said, and if it's a public building, it's impossible for it to be destroyed because nothing in Hong Kong would fall no matter what. <laughs> so what they said, you can go over the bridge Stonecutter's Bridge, but you cannot destroy it because it would never come down. And I go, all right, I get it. So all, uh, we started to remap the fight. And we didn't destroy any building that is real, but uh, you have to do everything. What I think is you have to take everything that is, if everything is outlandish and whimsical and great, nothing is real. You have to have a layer of reality, whether with, you're doing the, the physics, the geography, something has to be rooted. So with ILM, they were all for the challenge. And listen, they loved it. They were going to work with Jaegers and Kaijus for months and months in a row. They said, we are all people that grew up with that. So uh, Hal Hickel and I would use our free time and we would go to um, hobby shops in Chinatown and buy, buy uh, robots and monsters. And uh, I, 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 I love painting models. I love uh, collecting uh, vinyl figures. So we would use it doing that. You collect? I Th do. I that do. is collect. shocking. Yes, yes. Um, I know. Although, I, although, although I, I must say I'm, I'm showing great maturity. I told uh, Kim uh, yesterday morning or this morning, I said, I'm not going to bid on the Phantom of the Paradise suit. Because I have enough stuff. <laughs> I, I, I decided I'm, I have enough stuff. Although if something comes out on 4K HD, I will buy it. I, I mean, I have so many follow-ups, but I am curious. I know you like to, when you're making a movie, you like to make double of props or whatever it may be so you can keep stuff. So Firm Pacific Rim, uh, what is in your collection? I, have, uh, I wanted Mako's blue suit and her red shoes. And I wanted then uh, a Hannibal Chow's shoe, <laughs> one of the organs, uh, the spinal container, one of the bugs, and the escape pod. So I have all of that. And, and the maquettes that were made for the movie to pitch it to Warners and Legendary, which are absolutely magnificent. And Gypsy Danger in those maquettes is white. It was, it was not these colors, it was white. And it was really interesting. And then we, we realized that I'll, you lost a lot of detail if you photograph white, because white eats the detail. Same with red. Red eats all the detail. These are two colors that are very voracious. 
it's hard to get new ones. For those who have not seen the movie, there is an after the credit scene with Ron Perlman. Was it? How did you decide on that scene? And was it ever going to be something else? Yeah, there was no post credit scene, but we all loved Ron, and and then Thomas Stoll, who's one of the great, the greatest studio head, and that, that I ever met. Because he's a fan. Yeah, he is. He really was. He really was a fan. Yeah, a huge fan. A huge fan. And he said, oh, oh, if, if, if I gave you money, what would you shoot post credits? I said, Hannibal Chelsea, where is my goddamn shoe? You know, so we did it. And Ron was super happy to, to do it again. Yeah. How much was, did he, was, because there's like uh, the goo on him. Oh, was, that was goo. Yeah. Was it, was, when, he, when you tell him something like that, is he like, bring it on? Or is he like, really, do you really need me to have goo? It depends. Depends on the weekend he's planning. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes he wants to go home earlier. You know, no, but uh, Ron, Ron and I have gone through everything. So, you know, like the, the one thing, uh, you may know or not know this anecdote, but Idris Elba, uh, before we strapped him for the final battle, he said, um, I just don't want to get wet. And I said to him, oh, don't worry, don't worry. And I, we strapped him, and then you, you screw the control to the suit. He cannot move. And I, I said, open the water. And I will disclose this without saying the name of the actor. One of the actors got diarrhea. <laughs> and we couldn't unhook him in time. So there was drift compatibility of a different kind. <laughs> For a moment, we all went, ah, cut the lunch. <laughs> One of my favorite shots in the film is the, the, and you mentioned it earlier, is the child's perspective of the attack. Um, and I love the way it's shot, and it's just, it's just so well done. Can you talk about showing the perspective of the child and, I mean, in that sequence? There was one decision I made really, really early where I said, I don't want any of the masses running away from the monster. I, I want them all to be in a refuge so that you don't have to cut from below to above. Because then the battle should be between two things destroying a city, right? And I said, the only times we cut down is going to be when, the, when they're getting in the refuge, right? And in the memory of Mako that she must have felt she was entirely alone in that city. So she's walking with her shoe in her hand, and no one else is there. So those were significant. So I said, those two moments, we will go to the ground. Other than that, I didn't want to do the usual, uh, the people walking with the, with the dining table and their, you know, uh, like I wanted, I wanted to stay above. So... Planning it, what I wanted was a very beautiful transition on camera without effects, which is uh, Raleigh is talking to her, and the camera starts going around, and theatrically we lower the lights, and ash starts coming down, and she takes one step, and she's on the pavement. I wanted it to be a transition that felt almost like uh, theatrical, operatic, and then she is that kid. And, 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 and I, I really thought it needed to be, uh, the problem is you need an actress to play that kid that is that great. Because we rigged, I, I don't know if you know this either, but we rigged, the, we built that street and we rigged it with a giant hydraulics so that every time the, the monster takes a step, the whole street jumped about a couple of inches, bam, bam, and everything jumps. Everything, the whole set moved. We did a lot of things physically in this movie that that were very challenging. The the compots really were on, on on shakers when they were fighting. That these things moved from one side of the stage to the other because I wanted the physicality of it. You, you might not remember, but I I was fortunate enough to do a set visit on Pacific Rim. Yeah. And the thing that I remember most is I couldn't believe. How much like destruction you had put on that soundstage in Toronto? Yeah, with um, it was just a very impressive set. It was, a, and what we do, what we do is all the Hong Kong streets that were shot. What I do is I plan the sets, sort of like an eight figure, because you can shoot one way and then that's one street. You can turn around and it's a completely different street. So ultimately, all the streets in Hong Kong, 
all of them were shot in that single figure eight. And we would leave for two weeks and they would change the signs. Another thing we did that I'm very proud of is every American movie that takes place in Hong Kong writes bad Chinese. And we made sure that every single sign was written properly and every traffic sign, every uh, urban markings on the street, everything was accurate. To, it was not just a whimsy. Well, oh, it looks okay. We, we went, we, and we tried to capture the flavor of uh, Hong Kong in the future, in the 2020s, which <laughs> here we are, you know, nothing happened. This is going to be a nerdy question. Um, so did you ever, like, scientifically figure out how they were able to communicate through the breach, or you're like, F it, it's a movie? Oh, yeah, F it, it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely, no, absolutely. But, I mean, we figured out a bunch of stuff. Certainly, uh, John Knoll, who is very, very logical, uh, uh, said, well, uh, the first line of defense would never be a giant robot. And I go, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so there, there are certain things you have to say, well, but there would be no movie. But we talked about the other alternatives. And we, we did. We, uh, he, we said, OK, what would you use? You would use things like bunker busters, meaning there's missiles that could penetrate the kaiju, blah, 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 and they would explode inside. But if the target moves, even and they have no heat signature, because their, their life form is based on silicon, not carbon, and their, and their temperature is not tracked. Like we, we came up with a decent, uh, my dog ate my homework explanation <laughs> for why they came up with the uh, giant robots. Do you consider, is Pacific Rim Black, the animated series on Netflix, is that official canon? Or is that like, it's just a fun show? No, I, th what we did is we, the first couple of comic books that came out, we were very, very involved. And I think uh, there was a moment where I just said, look, I'm doing other stuff. So I, I have no idea what happens in that series, man. I, I hear is the people like it. I like that. But I, I have only limited time <laughs> in this life. I was doing Troll Hunters, man. I'm curious. This seems like it could be a really cool, big video game world. Yeah. Has there ever been discussion about making like a AAA title or something more than what's on the Xbox, like digital thing? Look, I really, really, really was so involved in the creation of the toys. I wanted all the toys that I could get. And the video games we didn't discuss uh, back then. I, I would love that, but I, I am the albatross of video games. Every time I get involved, they get canceled. Or, <laughs> or somebody fires Kojima. You know, so I, I, I better not get involved. I know we're just about out of time. I'm curious if you, two last things. Have you, as a director, seen any cool new technology or any cool new cameras that you are excited to be able to use as a filmmaker? I think the most exciting things that, I mean, obviously, when you have a big format, and you can do experiences uh, more in a park ride type of environment where you can make the audience participate and, and be part of it. Uh, I'm more interested in that for short um, rides. I think movies are you on a screen, you know, and I think that's what I'm interested in. I, I'm 58. I'm, I'm I'm really happy I've been there. I don't want to last beyond reasonable. I don't want to be always on the cutting edge. I do what I do, and I'll do it while they let me, and that's it. I would love to have been involved in park rides because I'm a big fan of that design. And uh, I've for, seen you at Disneyland, and you yeah, love Disneyland. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent, man. I mean, I I am I I love that. I love uh, what goes into that. And I know it quite well. And I know very well the tricks of that trade. So I, I have had, I had ideas. Like one of, ide one of the ideas that we, I wanted to do for Pacific Rim and uh, the tragedy of the release of the movie was that Warner Brothers and Legendary divorced yeah. during the launching of this movie. So the movie was not launched properly, was actually sort of counter-launched. 
I will not go into many other details because my lawyer said don't. <laughs> but it was not to the benefit of the movie the way it was launched. Uh, we managed to do $415 million, blah, blah, blah. And ancillary markets did so well, blah, blah, blah. But that was tragic. But one of the things I wanted to do, which I'll tell you because it would have been super cool. This is when laser projection was early. And uh, have you guys been to Comic-Con at San Diego? Next to the, the convention center, there's a very large hotel. And what I said is, at night, as soon as it's dark, we sound a gypsy horn, and we project in the entire facade of the building, gypsy breaking the building, and coming out and shooting at the light into the crowd. And we put a light in one room, and gypsy turns and destroys the building and shines the light. I didn't want to do it. And, you know, but that, that's the type of thing I would like to explore. I would like to, but at the same time, I, I like, uh, I like very much uh, um, to just stay uh, promoting the love of film as it is. I don't think technology, and size of screen, yes. Because the difference is uh, at home, the screen obeys us. It's like sit, sit, beg, good boy, right? That's television. Cinema overwhelms us and demands a ceremonial servitude from us. There is, every time art demands a certain humility, it's good for the soul. Humility is extremely good. And, and every time you submit to a force larger than yourself, namely Scorsese, <laughs> good. You, it's good for your soul. So I, I like that the art form should exist in that way and not just be hooked on technology. I think IMAX, size of screens, quality of sound, those are great things. So you have a lot of fans in this theater. Can you tease anything about what you are directing next? Well, I'm doing Frankenstein. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're working on it. We start shooting in February. And, uh, I mean, it's a movie I, I've uh, been wanting to do for 50 years since I saw the first Frankenstein. And I had an epiphany. And it's basically uh, a movie that requires required a lot of growth and a lot of tools that I couldn't have done 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And now I'm uh, brave or crazy enough or something, and and uh, we're gonna tackle it. It's Oscar Isaac, Andrew Garfield, uh, Christoph Waltz, Mia Goth, and we're working on it. Can I say something? Thank you for coming, guys. I mean, this is a movie I love, and this is as close as I can go uh, to having cookies and milk with you guys. This is as close as we can do it. And this is as, I liked it to be an intimate setting. I think this is the way I saw it uh, on, the, on the IMAX screen. The first time I saw it finally on 3D, uh, we took hundreds of days to do this 3D. We didn't do a quick job. We did it, pay Jim Cameron said, you either do it for this number of days or I'll be very angry with you. <laughs> And you don't want Jim Cameron to be angry at all. And, and, and to me, what I experienced back then, it was seeing the movie, and I made it, seeing the movie for the first time. So I hope it was like that for you, and thank you for coming, guys. Thank you.